35 years ago, I stepped onto the sweltering tarmac at Kai Tak Airport in August 1989, a confused and bleary-eyed kid from suburban California. One glance around, and I knew I wasn't in Kansas anymore. The heat and humidity were overpowering. The buildings were looming immense and everywhere. The people, I'd never seen so many people, all looked different. The food looked odd and unappealing to my corn dog and Capri Sun eyes. The writing was unintelligible, the language a sing-song of nonsense noises to this naive and sheltered kid. For the first time in my life, I was the foreigner, I was the minority, I was the outsider, and nothing will humble you faster. But this was home now, apparently, this loud, smelly, bright, brash, overwhelming place, and I had no idea how quickly or how deeply I would fall in love with her. But Alex, you've done Hong Kong. Why do it again? Why not Vietnam or Texas or Vietnam, I hear you pray. And friends are right, I usually don't retread old ground, but every now and then, a situation changes. A story unfolds and I'm compelled to return to a city I've been to before. But Hong Kong is different. Hong Kong was my home for many years. I love this place and I will shout aggressively about this place to basically anybody that will humor me. Also, we have unfinished business here. In 2018, we spent three days filming here, ostensibly to try and uncover how much the city had changed since the handover in 1997. We spoke to journalists. This is Hong Kong. They love their home, but there's also this different layers of uncertainty built on top of that. Hong Kong citizens, young and old. The Hong Kong identity has never been very clear cut. Oh, I even had my son with me, who was the same age as I was when I moved to Hong Kong in 1989. We ran out of time to cover all of the things that we wanted to talk about, but vowed to return just a few months later. Unfortunately, the world had other plans. And here we are, five years later, our first opportunity to return, and a lot has changed on every level. And while many can't or won't talk about that change, some feel compelled to, like this guy who just appeared. Unthinkable change. A lot of people in Hong Kong, they they didn't realize such a change would take place. Change has always come easily to Hong Kong. In its relentless pursuit of the almighty dollar, the past was frequently dispensed with, discarded as inconvenient or outdated or inefficient. Colonial buildings were demolished and replaced with glass and steel, and the harbor was routinely filled in to accommodate another boutique, another bank, or another highway. Even when I was coming back here two or three times a year, Hong Kong was always changing. The skyline would always change because some new skyscraper had erupted from the concrete. The harbor was just a little bit smaller than when I was last here because of the city's relentless, centuries-long reclamation project. But there are a lot more changes that have happened since I've last been here, some of them more sinister than a new high-rise. But the principles and values of this unique city somehow remained intact. 
In fact, they were fiercely and proudly protected by Hong Kong's population, and the cultural icons and rituals that were uniquely Hong Kong survived as a result. So it seemed like a tenuous equilibrium between the relentless march of progress and the sacred cornerstones of tradition had been reached. But then the tide turned. In 2014, a series of protests started that shook Hong Kong to its core. Angry at China's interference in local election law, Hong Kong citizens took to the streets in their millions to stand up against what they felt were the erosion of freedoms and rights guaranteed to them for 50 years after the 1997 handover. These continuous changes to the very fabric of Hong Kong society were always followed by monumental protests. That is until... Hong Kong has been hit by a surging coronavirus infection. Under the fog of COVID, the dilution of Hong Kong's independence continued. But now, the streets were empty. And when the veil was finally lifted, Hong Kong had changed forever. Not just politically, and not just societally, but its very identity had dimmed somehow. Things that made it unique, that made it Hong Kong, were becoming scarce to the point of extinction. COVID, or I should say Hong Kong's COVID policy, was brutal to this city. 650 days of restrictions in one form or another in the bizarre pursuit of a zero COVID goal brought this city to its knees. And when the rest of the world started opening up, traveling, eating, Hong Kong streets remained quiet and its restaurants remained shuttered. And eventually, the rest of the world stopped including Hong Kong in its cultural conversations. And I noticed something else as well. Every TV show, lifestyle, travel, food, that was produced during and after the pandemic, and there were a lot of them, every single one of them skipped over Hong Kong. All of them. Ugly Delicious, Somebody Feed Phil, Midnight Asia, Street Food Asia, Fuck Best Delicious, all of them. Not because they wanted to necessarily, this is one of the greatest food cities in the world, but because they had to. And as ideas, as TV shows, they all moved on. But I most certainly have not moved on. There's too much goodness here, too much uniqueness. But like so much of what makes Hong Kong unique, it's getting harder and harder to find. So they may all skip over Hong Kong, but I sure as hell won't. We're in Sham Shui Po, one of my favorite parts of Hong Kong. I've been coming here since I was 10 years old. In fact, I went to school just down that road in Yaya Chun. Back then, the school was on the flight path to the legendary Kai Tak Airport. Every 90 seconds, a plane would scream overhead and almost reflexively, we would stop our lessons, wait for the plane to go over, and then start up again. And for a 10-year-old kid from suburban California, that was a trip. But I soon got used to it and soon learned to love it. But that infamous flight path restricted the growth of Kowloon, an already overly populated area, significantly. You couldn't build buildings beyond a certain height and there were no flashing lights allowed anywhere in Hong Kong. But in 2005, when the airport moved to Lantau Island, what was once scuzzy, noisy, undesirable flight path land became priceless almost overnight. And this entire area erupted upwards in a twisting, writhing metamorphosis of redevelopment, regeneration, and gentrification. And Sham Shui Po was caught in the middle of that. This is and pretty much always has been a working class neighborhood, low income community and one of the highest cost of living cities in the entire world. There's some hard living going on here. Those coffin apartments, those cage homes that Hong Kong is infamous for, right here. Overcrowded tenement buildings, subdivided apartments, that, that's Sham Shui Po. But this is also one of the most interesting, exciting, vibrant neighborhoods in the entire world, not just Hong Kong. And one of the many reasons for that is these, Dai Pai Nong. Dai Pai Dong, which literally translates as big license stall, used to be everywhere in Hong Kong, hundreds, if not thousands of them. After World War II, the colonial Hong Kong government issued ad hoc licenses to the families of deceased and injured civil servants, allowing them to run 
hawker style street food carts as a way of making a living. They peaked in the 1950s and you could find them on almost every street corner. But they're so much more than a place to get a quick, cheap bite, which they still are today. They were a place for working people to gather and talk, a real social hub for the community. But their ubiquity and their popularity led to noise and traffic complaints. So in 1956, the government stopped issuing those licenses and actually went a step further by prohibiting the transfer or sale of those licenses to anyone except the proprietor's spouse or direct descendants. The government even offered millions of Hong Kong dollars to buy back licenses just to get them off the street. For an older proprietor, that was a difficult offer to turn down. So their decline was swift and consistent. But Dai Pai Dong represent the spirit of this city. But they are, like so much of this city's identity, fading away. There are only 20 left in Hong Kong, and half of them are here in Sham Shui Po. Oi Man Sang is a quintessential Dai Pai Dong. Since 1956, they've been feeding the great and the good of Hong Kong from their stall in Sham Shui Po. They, like most Dai Pai Dong, serve small stir-fry dishes prepared with lots of seasoning over insanely hot walks. And to get that signature heat, the stoves use kerosene, literally jet fuel, because no other fuel can get that heat that is required for this kind of cooking. But even the stoves are hard to find these days because the government stopped issuing licenses for them. A recurring theme of attrition and extinction in this city. But that wok hei, or breath of the wok, is like nothing you have ever experienced before. Cheap, fast, delicious meals served in austere but convivial settings with copious bottles of local beer. Paradise, as far as I'm concerned. But Dai Pai Dong are not just an experience for after the sun sets. Breakfast in Hong Kong is kind of an incongruous experience, another one of Hong Kong's cultural curiosities. Born out of the rather wonderful notion that the only good meal is a hot one, breakfast dishes in Hong Kong are a reflection of the city's history. Like this macaroni or noodle soup, it's simply instant noodles or elbow macaroni pasta in a broth and then uh, often served with ham and egg with tomatoes, soup or another variety of wonderful toppings. Not exactly what you think of when you think of Chinese food, but here we are. I'm Saint Mary's RBJ. Yes, people call me to call me. Yes, people call me to call me. They're very good at RBJ. Yes, my little girl calls me to call me RBJ. I'm very happy today to share my recipe. This is actually very special. I've never had many years ago. I think I've bought this for 10 years. I've never had this for 10 years. My friend is not comfortable. 咁啊，走嚟問我，喂阿 Vin， 我唔係好舒服啊，煮個通粉俾我食啊咁。咁我啊，咁啊病人通粉啦，腿通實完全冇問題噶啦，實你病嘅食食腿通啊。我哋細個人食雞雞仔粉，你唔識攞嚟，即係扎扎啲雞仔粉，好似雞咁嘅。咁啊，咁啊煮個通粉佢啦。咁佢話佢話，我啲時候熱狗熱狗放新鮮番茄嘅。佢話誒，我都冇乜胃口，你抌啲番茄落去煮，酸酸地咯。咁啊，跟住佢食咗，佢就。哦，好好味喎 ！Irene， 我覺得成個好精神，好翻好多喎。咁嗰個就第一個菜。Irene is the embodiment of the Dai Pai Dong spirit, the inventor of dishes to feed the community. She, like her forebearers, took what they had available to them and created now iconic Dai Pai Dong dishes. Served in places like this, and actually born out of places like this in the 1950s, when proprietors started riffing on Western ingredients and Western dishes in an attempt to make them more accessible to local palates and the venues themselves more accessible to visiting palates. The result are these wonderful East, East, West concoctions that pretty much everybody here will have grown up on. Irene is among the last of a dying breed. She's had to adapt to survive even this long. She's seen the city evolve and fully understands that generations change and tastes change. But that doesn't mean the spirit of the Dai Pai Dong needs to change with it. Because Hong Kong now is like about 28 Dai Pai Dai Pai Dai. It's like this kind of mode. And also, at some level, we're a bit special. We're like a fusion of some kind. There's some meat, some meat, some meat, some meat. So, 
即係變咗佢嗰個覆蓋嘅性咧，即係比較即係係啦，咁啊，亦都可以講係複雜啲嘅。咁變咗咧，你睇到潮人多嘅，細路仔多㗎，細路仔多㗎。如果你譬如炒嘢嗰啲咧，就好多時候會係上咗年紀嘅。咁我哋就變咗就。好似吸納個層面比較大，係啦，即係只不過就依家就比較特別，就係多咗遊客。As Hong Kong continues down a path of uncertainty, we can only hope that people like Irene continue to preserve the traditions and spirit that make this city so unique. But what so many Hong Kongers grew up on is becoming harder and harder to find. Sure, the mechanics of the day-to-day -day remain at least superficially intact, and to the casual visitor, Hong Kong probably feels like not much has changed. It is and will always remain a fantastic place to visit. But there has been fundamental damage to the pillars of this city. That is undeniable. Ask anyone about life here, and you will hear exasperation and frustration and desperation, alongside fierce pride and a renewed urgency to preserve what remains of this city's identity. But ask them to talk about it on camera, and you'll get a knowing smile, a chuckle, and a "I don't think so." And I think that speaks volumes about what has been taken from this city: its voice. Hong Kong is one of those rare places where I don't actually feel out of place here. I know that sounds a little bit silly because I am, by definition, out of place here. But when I visit a new city for the first time, or even revisit a familiar favorite, I always have that sense of the outsider. I observe local customs and etiquette with a fastidiousness that borders on compulsion, and I'm convinced that I'm a nuisance and irritation to every waiter, shopkeeper, fellow transit rider that I come within 50 feet of. Not here, though. I feel at home here. My Cantonese is elementary and stumbling. My chopstick use is passable but inelegant. But I have core memories here. Many of them. Wonderful, happy moments of Hong Kong being home, where my friends, my family, my stuff was. The things that mattered. I think that goes a long way to explaining why I am so protective of this place. I'll be honest. I've been hesitant to complete this episode for a long time. We started in 2018 with the somewhat lofty idea of seeing Hong Kong through a child's eyes again, to see what had changed since I first saw it. But as time passed and the world moved on, I became resigned to the fact that this episode would never see the light of day. It felt like an impossible task to neatly summarize what Hong Kong has been through in the years since we were last here. Beyond that, I never felt like I'd be able to capture what Hong Kong means to me in a 20-minute video. I'd always feel that we'd missed a place, or a dish, or a person, or an idea. How can we possibly do this magical place justice? So I can tell you this: we will be back, and we will be making more Hong Kong content. Because even though there's something truly heartbreaking going on here. This place is by no means dead. There's too much good here, too much worth preserving, too much that needs to be shared and experienced and enjoyed. And while you can, of course, view Hong Kong from afar through the distorted lens of social media, where everything is neat, tidy, and orderly, the rough edges and noisy soundtracks are what make Hong Kong so perfect and so beautiful. So put down the phone. Get on a plane and come to Hong Kong while its uniqueness still shines. <laughs>